be done out of uh, respect and, and honor. Uh, you know, Frank's outward background is really the best pedigree that you could have. Uh, as you can see here, he was born in England, raised in France. Um, and right off the bat, you realize that he is a multilingual, uh, multi-talented and multi-experienced person who brings many points of view to his service in neurosurgery. Uh, and, and, you know, the James Bond of neurosurgery is, is pretty accurate, actually. I've never heard that before, but I think it's, it's pretty accurate. Um, I, I just want to say that I've gotten to know Frank over many, many years, and he was here uh, the moment I arrived back in the early 90s, it became a, a close friend. Uh, and I have learned an enormous amount from Frank uh, through, his, through his journey. Um, it, was, it was early in his journey. And so I have photos here from a trip we took before we had kids to, to Indonesia. Um, and uh, then uh, our families became extremely close uh, I, I feel like we almost raised our kids together in, in many ways, taking many family vacations and uh, visiting each other in, in wonderful locations. Uh, some of my sweetest memories raising our kids are with uh, Alex and Max and, uh, and uh, Frank's kids and uh, together. Uh, Frank has always been interested in art and photography, whether he is taking pictures uh, in, a, in a wonderful moment or posing uh, for the pictures himself, uh, you know, always digging in and enjoying the moment, whether it is with little kids at the highest levels of art or neurosurgery on the television and so on, uh, someone who just is comfortable in his own skin in, in so many different ways. Uh, early on, he started a project in art, uh, collecting art and stimulated by Nina uh, they became widely known, and here you can see an article in Art News uh, recognizing them among the top 200 collectors in the world. Um, at one point, he decided to explore this even more deeply, uh, and it, be, it was splashed around, around the world that uh, Frank was going to work for a while for Gagosian. Um, and, you know, continuing his James Bond of neurosurgery, he really lived it to the fullest, traveling around the world and meeting the most interesting people, uh, doing the most interesting things while always, you know, keeping his, his feet on the ground um, and going through some really hard times and recouping and, and finding himself um, and getting his feet on the ground again after really hard times uh, has made me happy and I, and I know that has made him happy. But nothing makes him happier than the success of both of his boys who are following in his art footsteps. Uh, Max is up and coming and, at, you know, it's more than up and coming. He's succeeding wildly uh, in, the world of, in, in the world of art. And you can read about Max and his accomplishments. And Alex, uh, also a budding and rising and highly talented photographer and artist himself. Uh, but Frank is a neurosurgeon and one that I respect. I have, I've worked with Frank in the operating room, out of the operating room, I respect his opinion. Um, uh, and, and I also do so of his colleagues. Here's his boss, Jake. Oh, I mean, uh, it's, it's uh, not Jake, I forgot. Um, but uh, Frank, it is a pleasure to welcome you in whatever you wanna speak about. And today I understand you're gonna tell us a little bit about the concepts of endurance in neurosurgery, so welcome. And you want to un unmute yourself, Frank. Now you're muted. You hear me now? Uh, it looks like you got two microphones there. Maybe I need to. I think we're. we're, 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 we're. Can you hear me? Yes, that's good. Okay, great. Um, 
So first of all, obviously, thank you to for these kind words, uh, Josh. My um, my biggest pleasure in neurosurgery has been to meet fantastic people, and and you're on top of that list. So uh, thank you, as my chairman and as my friend, for this introduction. I have no true disclaimers except that, uh, as you can see, I'm I'm not always the best at uh, at computers, and so. My son helped me with this talk, and so in that respect, he, he deserves the disclaimer. Today, we're going to be talking about um, neurosurgery and endurance. I hope that you'll have the endurance to hold up throughout the, the talk, and we will explore certain aspects of neurosurgery that we probably don't talk about on a regular basis. Um, neurosurgery, at times, can feel um, very special. It could feel like this. And it is a place which is very lonely, where you could be quite isolated. It can feel very dangerous. You're exposed, you're taking risks. You're taking risks for yourself. You're taking risks for your patients. You have to be strong. And at the same time, you remain extremely vulnerable. And this climber here is a, is a special guy. His name is uh, Alex Honnold. He uh, actually free soloed El Capitan in 2017 and uh, has been recognized as one of the greatest athletic achievements of all times. Um, National Geographic made a um, documentary about that event and I strongly recommend you look at it. It's called uh, Free Solo. I've seen it three times and my palms are still sweaty at the third viewing. So it is, it is a worthwhile movie to watch. And neurosurgery can be extremely scary like this, but it also can be quite beautiful and peaceful. Um, often when you're under the microscope or if you're looking at things through the loops, you have the feeling that you're in some kind of uh, under water, heaven, and if you need to be reminded, uh, corals that look like the brain uh, there under the water to, to remind you of the beauty of what it could all be like. And as far as emotions go, it can also just be like this. At times, you just want to cry. That's, there's no answer to it. And uh, we'll go over these various aspects in the, in the following slides. And we're also going to discuss a little bit uh, this gentleman here, uh, Ernest Shackleton. It's a character that I got to learn a little bit more during this um, COVID-19 um, quarantine and lessons that we can be, that can be gathered from his experience. But we'll start with um, a concept that, as I said, we don't talk about too often in neurosurgery in this particular case. I'd like to start with, uh, with grace. And um, the first aspect of grace that I would like to emphasize is uh, planning. You can imagine that this climber, Alex Honnold, didn't come up to that point. As you can see, he's completely solo. That is to say, there are no ropes. There's nothing holding him. Any fall is uh, the last fall of his life. And um, you don't get to that level without having significant planning beforehand. He knows exactly where each nook and cracky of that rock is. And in neurosurgery, uh, that's, to me, the most important part of the procedure. It's the preoperative planning. You need to know ahead of time what you're going to do. You have to have a roadmap. And for us, that means studying the radiological studies all the lab values, all the clinical information, sharing that information with our colleagues and come up with a fantastic plan. As my coach used to say, you plan the race and you race the plan. So there is no explorative neurosurgery, you know, unless it's trauma. Once you go in, you need to know what you're going to do. And when you do it, and in the concept of grace, you want to try and do it in a way that is going to remain graceful. And so in order to emphasize the grace of movement, I'm relying now on um, the 
hands of a friend of ours who is um, a, a sushi chef. And I just give you a moment to look at it. As you can see, he's wasting no time. Every little movement is calculated. And at the end, you get this finished product. Um, it's my belief that this um, finished product is improved by the grace of the movement. That little piece of sushi will taste better because he did such a good job. And I think the results of our surgery will be improved if we can have the similar grace in our surgical skills. When we talk about grace, it should really go above and beyond the realm of just the operating room. Um, it's important to try and seek and find grace in relations that you have in the, with the rest of the world. So that by the time you enter the operating room, hopefully you come from a serene place um, where the case can unfold seamlessly. Um, and grace in relations is something that you're not born with. It's something you have to work at. And ultimately, um, if you work at it hard enough, you will get to a place where everything else will start to fall in, into place. When you talk about grace, the word divine comes up. So I can't help but mention it. Um, I'm not going to become mystical here. But there is a component of divine natural grace that should be listened to. And every one of us will interpret this in their own ways, that it's a component that should be at least um, heard because it's a strong voice that often is forgotten. And I put the word vision um, and the vision here is, comes back to Point number one, which is planning, you should have a vision of what the case is going to be like, how it's going to unfold. And at Mount Sinai, we have a great preoperative planning department that allows us to do virtual reality surgery and helps us with the uh, aspect of the vision of the case. Um, I know that when I scrub, I take a moment to think about what case, what the case is going to be like. I I try to analyze the key points in my head. Um, obviously, it's something that we do repeatedly, so hopefully it becomes second nature, but it's important to have that vision. On another scope, it's also important to have a, an idea of where we stand within the world and have a vision of where we are. Um, I'm always reminded of a parable, a Talmudic parable, and when you're part of a neurosurgical team, there are times where you could think of yourself as the, the best and highest thing that is out there, the most important human being. And so in those moments, you have to dig into your right pocket and pull out the small piece of paper that says you are nothing but a grain of sand on one of the countless beaches of the universe. And that puts you right back into place. But there are other times when you're part of that neurosurgical team where you're going to like think, my gosh, I, I'm, I'm a failure. I can't get anything right. At that moment, dig deep into your left pocket, pull out that little piece of paper, and you'll see that the words written there are the universe was created for you and you alone. And so hopefully you'll be able to balance these two components and have a great vision of where you are. Another aspect of neurosurgery that we don't discuss on a regular basis in these morning conferences is beauty. And um, we're very lucky in neurosurgery that what we're dealing with is what I would describe as beautiful anatomy. Um, we're, we're not dealing with abdominal contents, no disregard to colleagues who do, but we're very lucky to be dealing with the brain and the spine. And it's amazing to see how nature duplicates itself. When you go through the circle of Willis, um, you see these arteries, which really mimic what the corals look like here. 
you have almost this dendritic neural connective uh, cell architecture within these other corals. So we're very lucky that we're dealing um, with um, beauty and it's, it's a privilege in a certain way, but it's important for us to see this beauty because if, if we don't find it, we can't really restore it. And essentially one could see our job as, um, as a job of restoring the beauty that has been destroyed either by a tumor or by degenerative disease. And it is an act of beauty to, um, to look at a scan after you removed a, a complex tumor and see that the, the anatomy has returned to its, to its normal beauty. But not only in, in, in the brain, I'm, I'm excited uh, to see when my younger colleagues show me x-rays of uh, sagittal balance and, and, and you could see the beauty of restoring this, um, this spinal anatomy. Um, and in that respect, we have to seek that beauty so that we can restore it. Yet another element that comes to play in neurosurgery is the concept of fear. And fear should play a big role because what we're doing is actually pretty scary. Um, I always conceived residency as, um, as a video game. If um, when you're the chief resident, essentially if you make a mistake, it's as if you're doing a video game and you crash. And sure enough, it's disappointing, but you know, you always can start the next case and the attending is the one who's really bears the burden of it. And I'm sure Jeremy will understand that there is a difference between creating a CSF leak as a chief resident or as a junior attending. There's a whole different aspect to, to that problem. Um, we were talking earlier about the, uh, the rock climber and the ropes that he uses to get ready for his route is the ropes that we learn during residency. And ultimately, once you leave the residency, you're gonna be climbing without ropes and fear will keep you honest. It, will, it is the one thing that will help you be aware of what your limitations are, but also what your expectations are. And what do you do when you um, are stuck with fear? Well, um, you know, one of the best things to do is first of all, to take a deep breath and, and reconnect with the anatomy that I described earlier. When I'm in trouble, I, I always go back to the normal anatomy because that will give you a reference point. <clears throat> I also make sure that um, I didn't bury myself in a hole where all the blood is pooling in make sure your retractors are in place and let the light go in. But if all else fails, then don't hesitate to get some help. And uh, that's one thing that um, you should not be too proud of because often um, you will need help. I mentioned uh, Ernest uh, Shackleton and uh, Alfred Lansing wrote a book about him uh, called Endurance. I strongly recommend that book as well. And um, in a nutshell, Shackleton went to perform a trans-Antarctic expedition. Um, his boat got caught in ice and it's described by one of his sailors as uh, our, our ship was a, like an almond caught in a chocolate bar. And so they were essentially stuck in the middle of nowhere. They had to disembark and then they lived on through uh, almost two long winters in the Antarctic, uh, Shackleton was able to take a small boat and go to South Georgia where he found a whaling station. They rescued everybody. And through this book, reading Endurance and reviewing some studies about it, seven traits of leadership come up. Um, honesty, obviously, um, you know, the way you relate to other people is through their honesty. And it, you can't go wrong by being honest, especially when things go bad. 
And usually when things go bad is when you try to hide it, when you try to distort the truth. But if you want to have integrity and the respect of your peers, honesty is always the most painful thing at the beginning, but the most um, grateful aspect in the, on the long term. Team spirit, we've spoken about that so many times, I'm not going to bring it back, only to say, in the way I look at team spirit, it's not only the communication with our um, ENT surgeons or, or orthopedic surgeons. In my mind, the team spirit is all the team, all the time. And that is to say, even the, the orderlies who move the patients, the unit clerks, uh, everybody in the operating room, the x-ray techs, the, the people who do the monitoring, and the one aspect that can bring the whole team together, even if you've forgotten the name or not, is to smile. And that will go a long way. What I wanted to focus is point number three and six, which is decisive and improvise. These seem to be somewhat um, in dichotomy, but decisive, I think, goes back to the conversation I had about preoperative planning. It is, um, it is so important to know ahead of time what you're going to be doing and to be decisive about what you plan to do. By the same token, if something happens at time of surgery, you have to be able to improvise. You have to have a flexible mind that allows you to see what the options are. Do you need to increase your scalp flap so you can extend the craniotomy? Do you have to find a new trajectory for your pedicle screw. You have to be able to have the experience and the, and the flexibility of mind to make that happen. And the experience you will learn really as a resident um, by looking at other people performing surgery. I urge you to spend a lot of time looking and watching how the hands move, watching how people react to issues and to problem. Point number seven, is about faith. Now, for most people, that could relate to a higher being. And so be it. I, I, I think everybody will have their own interpretation for that. But for all of us who are performing surgery or part of the surgical team, it should be the faith that you have in yourself, the faith that you're going to get it done, the faith that you will survive. There is in neurosurgery, once you start a case, there is no plan B. It's not like you're gonna start the case and then say, you know what, I'm gonna come back in a couple of days and I'm gonna finish this. So you have to have the, the true faith in yourself that you are the right person to make this happen. Mental wellness is obviously gonna be a, an important factor. And um, I'm gonna bring up a few points about it. Uh, we're so fortunate to live in a uh, and to work in, a, in an area that is really at the center of one of the most prestigious city in the world. And there, therefore, we're in a very, very special position. And you can, you know, for lack of a better term, you can feel the feng shui coming out of that spot. But when you're on, when your time is on, when you're working, when you're on call, when you're in surgery, everything becomes extremely condensed. You know, we've all had days that feel like weeks. And at the end of the week, you turn around and you, you realize that a whole week has just gone by as fast as a day. And, um, and that's, that's a tough place to be. You know, you, you end up working so hard, you have no idea of what's happening. And I, I like the interview that Muhammad Ali had once, uh, and the journalist asked him, uh, uh, Muhammad Ali, how many sit-ups are you doing? And, and he turned and he said, I don't know, I only start counting when it really hurts. And that's what's happening with neurosurgery. If they ask you how many hours you work, I mean, I know now it's regulated. You really, you really are not counting you really start counting when it really hurts. And, and that's, that's the way it should be because if you wanna be free soloing up these rocks, you better be ready for it. So how do you 
deal with it while you have time off. Time off during residency and then again later on is probably the most precious commodity that you have. It's, it's more valuable than money. It's more valuable than possession. And uh, the reason why I put this, this long waiting line, which at this point, I guess it's not socially distancing, um, was to recall a small anecdote where I finished a particularly gruesome week of um, being on call and I went to the local supermarket um, and was buying groceries only to find that the wait at the cash register was going to be at least 10 or 15 minutes. And I looked at it and I said, I just don't have the time for that. I dropped my basket and I walked out and and it's a small anecdote, but it, to me, those 15 minutes were going to be super precious. So make it count for you. Make that time out be um, as valuable as you possibly can. And you have to realize during residency, because it's so tough, you slowly build a protective armor around you. You're building up a layer by layer, uh, a, a garment that will allow you to resist uh, to all the problems that are coming your way. So that time off, you have to try and dig under those layers and remember who you are. There's a great little motivational um, video by Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he, he says, look, if you think you don't have time to work out, and if you think you need eight hours of sleep rather than six hours of sleep, well, then just sleep faster. So I love that that quote, space in when you're in the um, call schedule again, or when you're just working, everything becomes condensed. You're spending time in operating rooms only to go to a patient room or sitting in a, in a conference room. Pretty much none of these rooms have windows. You're always in, you're always condensed. And therefore, when you come out of it, um, for lack of a better term, you should really space out. And the first thing I do when I get out is I look out at the clouds. Those are the objects that are the furthest away that you can actually see. So here's a rendition of clouds by um, one of my favorite Dutch painters from the 17th century called Ruysdael. And um, it, it is, um, it's a great thing for your eyes. It's a great thing for your mind. Obviously, we live and work close to Central Park, so that should be part of your routine if you can. Um, some of us, Dr. Bettison included, has uh, mastered long distance running. And when we talk about endurance, it's a great skill to have. But maybe it's not going to be running. It could just be lying down in the grass, uh, whatever it takes. Uh, do enjoy um, the park, do enjoy the sports and do enjoy the city, which means, you know, go downtown, check the galleries, go to the theater. You're living in New York, and that's what you should do. If you were in Seattle, you'd be sailing, or if you were somewhere in Midwest, you'll be horseback riding, whatever it takes. And if you ever have an opportunity to spend time in the, in the nature um, during your holidays, that's what I would recommend. We talk about music and um, there is a study of psychotherapy um, that compared for anxiety and mild depression, two hours of therapy a week versus listening to classical music for two hours a week. And um, the results were pretty similar in both cases. So that uh, if you have the option to listen to some classical music or do some equivalent um, musical adventure, I strongly recommend it. You can see here where my preference lies uh, when I listen to music in the operating room. And um, I like to think of surgery um, at times as a dance. And especially when you get uh, towards the end of the case, I always ask for closing music because that rhythm keeps you going. Wisdom, you're going to get it from your masters and teachers at um, the neurosurgical level, but you also need to expand your mind. And, and that is 
uh, to read and and it's so easy to forget to read so sometimes i i would suggest you you can even listen to books everything now is on audible don't just read the news read some real books and during residency you know you you often get so busy that um, you forget your parents and the residency is so long by the time you're done your parents have just become older and so I, I would strongly recommend that you spend a little time talking to them if you possibly can. Um, you know, um, we live in New York City. Um, right now, we're a little limited because of COVID, but if you're living here, you, you, you have to live it entirely. You have to enjoy it. There's no point being here if you're not really going to engage with this was this city. And this city was great to me in many different ways. Um, among other things, it allowed me to work with some true uh, neurosurgical giants from whom I've learned so much. I'll just bring up the name of some of the people who um, were at Mount Sinai and are probably uh, on the forgotten side right now. Dr. Peng Wang was our uh, neuroradiologist and, and a superstar in that field. And he once told me um, something that resonated. And he said, you know, uh, as neurosurgeons, you can only be judged appropriately by your own peers. And, um, you know, when you say in the general public, hey, I'm a neurosurgeon, everybody kind of gasps in awe and so forth. The reality is the only um, acclaim that you should look for is the acclaim from your peers. Um, obviously, um, Dr. Sashlev was uh, a great mentor and a great surgeon. He was just fantastic fun to, to watch operate and to learn from him. Subsequently, you guys all know Dr. Post, who I learned a lot just from his demeanor, his preparation, and the way he operates. Um, but the big name that's going to resonate um, is Dr. Malice. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about his accomplishment, but I will say that he was extremely humble in a certain way, although that may not come up uh, through his narcissistic uh, behavior, but uh, he was well balanced. And, and he once told me, you know, a bus driver that does not get into any accidents throughout his career probably saves more lives than a neurosurgeon ever will throughout his career. So that's what we, we have to remember um, endurance obviously um, you know is important to keep the focus dr bettison from who i've learned a lot um, as well through his um, extreme understanding of people and connections and relations uh, has been able to do this throughout his training, but also throughout his, uh, his running career. Um, you can look at residency as a marathon and ultimately there is an end to it. The same way as, Dr. as um, Ernest Shackleton went to Antarctic to perform an expedition, once you cut skin in a surgical case, you're actually entering an expedition. You have to have those seven traits that were described. You have to be ready for it. Um, you know, I've showed you throughout this talk that neurosurgery is, um, is similar to a rock climber, underwater, cli underwater scuba diver. You're a sculptor, a marathon runner, a sushi chef. You're a, an explorer, but you also are a crying baby. So um, at any time that you need help, make sure that you reach out, um, reach out to your parents if you can, if you have that luxury. And I'll finish on a, a rendition of the American flag by um, um, my son, Alex, who helped me with this uh, presentation. And those, um, this little artwork is, is based on a multiple Polaroids that he took and then put together to, um, to represent the American flag. Thank you very much for your time.
the thing I miss the most about a live audience is missing the applause. <laughs> and uh, this this really was spectacular. I just I wish that I I actually am going to find a way to pipe in an applause. Uh, Chris, we have to work on this. Definitely. Uh, Frank, so much wisdom and so much intelligence and very well presented. I'm sure there are questions from the audience. I'll start with one. Uh, how do you get up and dust yourself off from the mistakes that don't easily resolve themselves? A deficit that you've caused, a an error in judgment, uh, something that doesn't always end well. How do you how do you incorporate that into your experience and and move on? Because that's that's a part of neurosurgery that is really quite devastating. Yeah, I I, I agree with you. Um, so first of all, these mistakes, unfortunately, you never dust them off. They um, they remain embedded, and you know I've done countless cases, and if you ask me to remember my cases, I'll always remember the mistakes, and there's just no going uh, back on that. But the only way you can do it is you create this armor that the armor that that I um, that I mentioned during residency. You you kind of create a shield that allows you to. To move on and as I mentioned you you have to find the beauty in it and um, and you have to find the balance um, you know you have to dig deep into the right pocket the left pocket the universe is created for you you're just a grain of sand you just have to find the right place that um, yeah, it's not gonna be easy it certainly isn't I, I would encourage questions from the residents, from anyone in the audience. You manage um, a chaotic environment. You know, sometimes you'll be in the operating room and there'll be a few people kind of communicating, talking, maybe some, some people kind of freaking out about something or other. You know, how, how do you manage that situation and try to maintain a, a graceful environment? And I, th and I like that question, Chris. Um, you know, we talk about team and it's great to have a team and you cannot do it without the team. But at the end of the day, there is only one boss. There's only one captain. There's only one Shackleton in the expedition. And so the chaos is going to have to be orchestrated um, by you. And if you're going to be in charge, you have to be totally in charge. You have to be able to set the mood in the room. And that's what I was trying to allude to by having some grace um, when even before you come to the operating room. So you, you'll be aware of what's happening. You have, you know, some of us have better understanding of emotional intelligence than others. But either way, you've got to be able to analyze the situation. And, and you need to address the issues as they go along. But hopefully, if you come in with the right attitude, if you engage people, if you're able to project uh, a real faith and a positive attitude that everything is going to happen, then the team will fall in place. And we all live in chaos. That's part of our, part of our life and neurosurgery in, in particular. But it can be organized chaos. And it chaos in itself has a beauty and you can dance on it. That's what I was trying to allude to with the music. It, it won't happen on the first case or the 10th case, but ultimately it, it will come and you just need to take control of um, the situation. Obviously you will only be able to do that if you yourself know what you're doing. And that's where the years of working as hard as you possibly can is are going to come into place. You have to be a master of your skill. Otherwise, uh, chaos is going to take over. There's no doubt. Uh, thank you.
Thank you. We, you know, we've got a few questions. Um, right now, for some reason, I'm not able to see if somebody's raising their hand on my computer. Costas, right. <clears throat> Costa, do you have a question? I do. Uh, hold on. Frank, that was an amazing uh, presentation, and I really appreciated a number of points that you uh, spoke so well about. You know, as we move through life, you know, leadership is something that is becomes more and more important. And, it, you know, we're starting some of these uh, talks with the residents and trying to define what leadership means to everybody. And I think some of the things I heard from you were beauty in everything that you see and appreciate um, different aspects and views of things which uh, you have. Uh, and the, the thing that struck me the most, I think, is, is the character component. And I just wanted you to expand on that a little bit. I, I think, you know, mentorship you talked about and, and some of the qualities that really have caught your eyes, but some of the, the things that you believe represent character, you touched on them a little bit, but I just wanted to hear some more about that. Yeah, I mean, look. First of all, I'll 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 say these are very personal opinions. Everyone is eventually gonna have to dig deep into their own strength, and each one of us has a different character. Um, over the years, I guess that what I've learned is that it it makes sense to um, to understand that. Ultimately, you're going to get through this. That it's going to it's going to work out for the best. There may be moments where things don't seem to be going in your direction, but ultimately, you will you will survive, and you will actually not only survive, you'll you'll excel at what you're doing. Um, so, the strength of character comes from your personal inner strength. You could pretend that you're a strong master, you could pretend that you're a good listener, but unless you really understand who you are to begin with, all of this is gonna seem pretty um, superficial. And the understanding of yourself comes only through experience and the experience only comes through failure. So you need to really push yourself. That's the beauty of neurosurgery is you can, you can really push yourself to points that few people do. And the reasons why um, uh, some of us enjoy endurance sports is we push our bodies above and beyond where the human mind thinks it can go. And that those moments build, um, build character, but it could also be, you know, by, writing or doing art, creating. There's so many aspects that allow you to rediscover yourself. And from that solid base, then everything else flows. Thank you. Chris, uh, did, you, did you say yeah. there were others? Raj, did you also have a question? Yeah. So Frank, uh, phenomenal talk uh, as expected. You know, Frank, for, for us, for those of us who trained at Mount Sinai, you're an iconic figure because of uh, your, your uh, intelligence, your skill, but also your balance. And so one of the things that, you know, I've struggled with, which I think many of us struggle with is um, how do you maintain your balance so well? I mean, you, you have a busy life, um, but you have an enormously busy um, after neurosurgery life which is complicated and is very deeply evolved. Is that something you thought of before you began? Is it something that changed as you started training? How do you maintain that discipline of that balance? Because the job is all encompassing. Right. Well, well, first of all, you know, what, what seems like on the outside may not always be the same <laughs> on the inside, but um, I think that, I think that what's important ultimately is to realize that neurosurgery is a fantastic um, endeavor, but that in itself, ideally, it would not define ourselves. You don't want to be defined just because you're a neurosurgeon. 
because then you kind of put yourself in a box and if everything you do is related to that box if it crumbles you're in you're in trouble so it may take 90% of your time for a long period of time and and therefore you say oh i'm a neurosurgeon that's it that's so great and and that's how i live and that's how i'll die but it's just such a big world out there and it's you'll be surprised there's so many other things if you are interested enough to become a neurosurgeon you are interested enough to look at so many other things because it takes a special person to be ready to work as hard as it as you have to in order to become a neurosurgeon so then just use that that propensity to hard work to just focus on some other aspect whatever it is whether it's sports arts reading obviously your family is going to be part of it and organizing your days is is the key thing you know you have to be able to leave neurosurgery behind um when i walk into my house i never talk about neurosurgery it it just disappears and then it reappears when i go back to work and so all the time that's out of surgery becomes basically my time off which is what i described earlier your time off is your most important commodity and behooves you to use it as fully as you possibly can and just sitting in front of a tv is just not not going to cut it otherwise then you shouldn't have become a neurosurgeon thanks great uh well thank you I, there are probably a couple of uh, other questions and i think we'll 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 continue this uh Frank, I wanted to thank you for your wisdom. There's so much that we can learn from each other. Um, I agree with you that the best part about neurosurgery is the people. And everywhere you turn, you're going to find a certain amount of wisdom uh, to have gotten to the point where you're doing this sort of thing with your life. So I, I appreciate that. And uh, we'll invite you back for follow up after uh, after your next turn and your next adventure. So thank you so much. We do still have two questions. Um, Dr. Prostkoff. Um, I think you're you're able to speak now. Melvin Prostkoff. Okay, we've also got a question from Alex Reynolds. Thank you. Thank you very much for articulating what you said and how you feel the uh, experience of training at Mount Sinai was uh, so good for you. Uh, we certainly had good role models. You, you know that I was known as Captain Mel because of my flying, because when I had to go, when I went flying and my flying was done on instruments, uh, that forced me to step away from neurosurgery at that time to focus just on what I was doing. And yet the same discipline of flying in three dimensions was the same thing that we were doing in the operating room, uh, working in three dimensions. So I think you did a wonderful job of explaining things uh, today. And thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Prosko. Um, Alex? Hey, Frank, thanks so much for your talk. I was just wondering, you seem to get a lot of energy um, out of this city. And since the city has been on lockdown, I kind of wonder how you've been dealing with that and if you have any advice for the rest of us yeah well um yeah there i mean obviously the city is in lockdown and right now it's pretty dead and it and it's actually pretty sad i must say um but there is um there are options so whenever you can go out of the city and explore just a little bit the uh, outskirts you can find places that are fantastic right now and one of the aspects that i've learned through this lockdown was the reconnection with the rhythm of the seasons because you got to see nature unfold itself a little bit slower it seems like so 
in the concept of trying to find beauty in everything that you can do, um, there is a certain beauty in the torpor and the slow movement that's going on. I, I think this city, um, you know, it is incredible because of its geographical location among other things. And, and when you run in Central Park, you're gonna see these, these kind of rocks that come out and, and show their faces once in a while. That gives you an idea of what the city is built on, on these incredible rocks that are underneath, under Earth. And to me, there, there is a, a bed of energy out of that that exists whether we're in lockdown or not in lockdown. So even if the city is a little quieter, I, I feel as if um, it's, it's just sleeping for a moment and in a few m months, if not years, it's gonna, it's gonna come back and it'll be exciting as it was before. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Moore. And uh, that concludes our Grand Rounds for today. Thank you, everybody. everybody.